I am so glad you could join us. I'm your host, Mo Gaudat. This podcast is nothing more than a conversation between two good friends sharing inspiring life stories and perhaps some nuggets of wisdom along the way. This is your invitation to slow down with us. Welcome to Slow Mo. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Today, I'm in the buzzing city of London. If you've ever been here, everyone is rushing around like a maniac. It seems so pressuring, so driven, so fast. And yet, as you walk through this wonderful city that you never really managed to fully love and never really managed to fully hate, uh, you find those beautiful parks scattered all over the city which makes it sort of uh, um, natural. You know, there's so much nature around. And I always loved that about London. I always used to joke with my friends and say, uh, this um, uh, city is fast nature. You know, you're rushing around all through the city and then every now and then you get to a park. Uh, And I once then noticed that there was this very clever little chain of fast food restaurants that was called Naturally Fast, or the mission of it sort of was Naturally Fast uh, Food, and it's called Leon. And um, that really caught my attention. Naturally Fast and Fast Nature seems to be, you know, an interesting description of how life is over here. Their mission, I I found out, was we're going to make tasty food that is good for you, but good for the planet. And I, I love that, you know. For years now, that idea of doing business for good or using business to do good actually is something that's really missing. Since I probably say the beginning of the 20th century, business was all about the money, really. You know, you you build a business plan, you go to investors, you talk about what you're trying to do. And most investors will listen and smile and then say, how much money are we going to make? And, you know, in my mind, I feel that that capitalism is probably the most powerful tool on the planet. You know, if you want to scale anything or get uh, to the proper reach across the globe, you probably have to use the engine that is known as capitalism. And so it seems that Leon was based on that. It's like, we're going to feed you, it's going to be fast food, but it's going to be good for you and good for the planet. And I think that's a really interesting idea that I've been contemplating even for my happiness mission. Anyway, turns out that Danny Donnecke, who's, um, I hosted here on Slow Mo in episode 169, and then we became the closest of friends, an amazing human being, knows the founder or the co-founder of Leon, uh, John Vincent. And so he introduced us. I um, invited John over to uh, come uh, and chat about that idea of using business to build better things for humanity. Turns out that he's a, a, a good business addict. So, you know, uh, after Leon, he ran the UK's government school food plan. You created and uh, chaired uh, the Council for Sustainable Business, good, which was basically- Good basic, memory, man. Yeah. Uh, no, I, thought, I studied you really, really well. Um, and, the, and and now you have uh, Longhouse, which yes, is- the Longhouse. Yeah, uh, the Longhouse is an effort to basically, I love, love the description, to to sort of motivate uh, positive disruptors. You know that in in our world of business, the idea of disruption is so important, but uh, maybe disruption can be good to our planet too. So um, he agreed to come and visit me in my tiny little Airbnb here. Lovely. Uh, Thank you. And uh, and we uh, will just talk about if business can actually be good for humanity and lots of other topics. So uh, joining me uh, in, uh, cong- in welcoming uh, John Vincent. Thank you oh, so much for so being much here. Thanks for a lovely introduction. Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, I have, to, I have to say it's the, 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 you seem to be the odd one out when it comes to business. Like nobody really cares about good for you or good for the planet. Mostly what businesses do is they do what they have to do to make profits and then they have a strategy around yes. social responsibility yes. that basically makes them look good. Yes. You, you yes. didn't do it that way. You went the opposite way. Oh, we once um, 
Henry and I once uh, were kindly given an award by an organization called First, which I think is a, it's almost like the in-house magazine for foreign office people around the world, actually. And it was the award for sustainable capitalism. And mm. uh, someone who uh, presented the award, who later became um, Savage Javid, who I think that's how I pronounce his name, who later became actually chancellor uh, recently in the UK of the Exchequer. Um, and he, as he was giving it to us, he said, we, we know the purpose of capitalism is to make money, but oops, we'd better, we know we'd better make it a bit more sustainable. And as I was, <laughs> yes. as I was, I remember as I was walking up to the stage, I said, it just, it just, it just occurred to me that that description is just not a fair reflection on humanity because, you know, what I said in my gra grateful acceptance speech was that uh, I think it's looking down the wrong end of the telescope. Because if we were a tribe in the in the uh, rainforest, the chief, if the chief gathered everyone around and said, "Look, our objective, guys and girls, is to make money." <laughs> but once we've poisoned the rivers and once we've killed the monkeys and we've killed the insects, then we'll give back. Uh, maybe we'll go to a charity event uh, and we'll bid for some footballer's shirt, sign shirt, uh, and we'll we'll give back to a charity. Well, you know, to give back. Once we've destroyed everything, when when you put it this way, it sounds <laughs> and so and so, <laughs> and so I remember thinking, well, surely the purpose of any endeavour, it, whether it's whether it's what you might call charity or whether you, it's what we might call commercial with those labels, any endeavour must be to create something magic and to do something to protect the amazing assets that we already have. Be those emotional assets that we have or be those physical assets that we have in the world our job is to just make the most of those and to help humans be human beings that's what the purpose of business must be but we must do it in a way uh which is financially sustainable mm. so for me you go on holiday the fuel is essential you would like to have some fuel in your airplane as it's going across the atlantic but but burning fuel it's not the objective of going on holiday, but the fuel is pretty important if you want to sustain what you're doing, if you want to actually get the aircraft the other side. So to that, to that point, the holiday is the objective. The doing some good must be the objective. The improving humanity's position on this planet must be the objective of any business, because otherwise we're back to sort of donut economics where we're slowly eating away at the core of society or slowly eating away at the core of the planet's ecological resources, for what gain? So I just think that we need to look down the other end of the telescope. But, but that's that's not what people do. I mean, when I when I joined Google back in two thousand uh, and end of two thousand six, beginning of two thousand seven, um, Google was um, a business that was entirely about organizing the world's information mm -hmm. and uh, making it universally accessible and useful. Was the mission. And I can promise you, you walk the corridors. Actually, I worked for um, for Google uh, EMEA, which was headquartered yeah. here in Belgravia. Yeah. And then you walk around the corridors and everyone knew why we were there. We were there to organize the world's information. And yeah, money is a side product of that. And money sort of, you know, helps fuel that. Uh, but that was for the first few years. And then of course, you know, and I don't blame Google for it. The business grew and grew and grew and grew. And then they started to uh, have to run it like an adult, if you want, you know? And so you, you get what I used to call the bureaucrats in, which is not yeah. a bad word. They're good at what they do. They maximize profit. They make sure that you're in compliance. And suddenly the business loses track of that mission of organizing the world's information. Mm -hmm. And the conversation becomes entirely around how much more are we going to make next quarter? How much more are we? It seems that the system is set up in a way that's not favoring doing any good at all. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think that there are so many businesses, as we know, that start off mission-led uh, and then they become empty um, because actually what happens is the uh, they they adopt what Warren Buffett might call the, inst the institutional imperative. Mm. And sometimes that's because the professionals that run it uh, are not necessarily the, f the founders anymore. Absolutely. And those people have uh, a completely different agenda. I mean, look at what happened with Apple, where in the interregnum between Steve Jobs' two principal stints at Apple, 
the guy came in and said, no, from now on, we're a manufacturing business. We're going to be really good at running computer factories. That's what we're going to do. And guys, the grown-ups are here now. Yeah. And I think that when the grown-ups arrive in some of these businesses, you absolutely you, you lose the zeal because someone comes in and as the, as the chief executive, they're, they have clearly they have investors, if you've got the wrong investors, who don't have the right measures. We'll come back to that in a minute, hopefully. Then the metrics of the professionals running those investment companies uh, and then the metrics of that CEO are absolutely probably a three, maximum five-year stint as CEO. Mm. And that CEO's mindset is, I'd like to have a motorboat as big as my friend's motorboat. And um, <laughs> yes. and my wife would, or husband, sorry, mm. my husband or wife would like to for me to be successful and to keep up with the Joneses. And then we will have reached the promised land as a family and we can start having some fun at that point. And that's just the cycle that everyone gets into. So mm. gone are the days where you have the Quakers running a business or where you have, you know, Mr. Roundtree uh, building houses for, in that case, his, his uh, workers. You know, for me, we're missing the professionalization and the, um, the domination of the professional management class mm. has divorced us from passion and divorced us from mission. And professionalization has taken away heart and, uh, and love from business because actually people feel embarrassed to talk about that if they're professional CEOs. I mean, it, it, it's sad when you say it this way, because in a way, um, we all know that that CEO eventually gets the boat and eventually his wife gets whatever she's planned for and they have a slightly bigger uh, house, you know, than their neighbors. Yeah. And it's all empty. Mm. I mean, in, mm. in reality, uh, I mean, I know two types of CEOs, honestly, and I know hundreds, mm. hundreds and hundreds of them. You have that type that eventually wakes up and goes like, what am I doing with my life? Right. Mm. And you have the type that uh, somehow, despite how intelligent they are, they just don't get it. Right. So, you know, they work really hard, make tons of money, have a a very, very lavish life and then go like, but I'm still not happy. Maybe I need more money. Okay. Yeah. And, and so they work yeah. even harder and harder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But neither of it actually works at all. And perhaps the ones that I've on, on the only ones I found happy were the ones that felt they were making a difference. I, I, I have an experience. Also went to an osteopath, a guy called Renzo Molinari, uh, almost like the grandfather of, of, of osteo osteopathy actually in, in, uh, in London, in the UK. And I said, how many of your clients are happy? And he said, very few of very my, few. very few are happy. And he said, very few of the well-off ones, rich ones, very full of ones with money. He said, the only ones of my clients are the ones that are actually doing what they love. They're actually doing what they love. And I think, I don't know whether you know Alan Watts or you remember Alan mm -hmm, Watts, the mm -hmm, philosopher, of course, yeah, one, yeah. Of his, one, of his more pop, one of his more populist and slightly more accessible um, little videos explains that we've got the wrong analogy about life. It says, you know, we've got, and I'm sure you're all over this in your happiness projects, but um, he said, you know, we take the anal analogy of a journey and people say, well, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. He said, but that's fine, but there's not even a destination. So how can there be a journey even, right? Oh, so, what he's saying so, is, so what he's saying is the universe is inherently playful, right? So instead of using the journey analogy, we should be using play as an analogy. You, we, we, when you play the piano, you're not trying to get through the piano piece as fast as possible. Yes. When you're dancing, and I know you, I'd like to talk about dance. My wife uh, did, did uh, Dancing with the Stars or Streetly Come Dancing here. But it's not about getting to a point on the dance floor as fast as possible. Right. <laughs> it's such a beautiful and so way to look he at. He says it. the universe is inherently playful and we must play. And that is what we must do. But we must play in a way that doesn't compromise or screw up the wonderful natural re resources and the beauty of the world that we have inherited and that we should leave to our children. So that's basically, um, you know, of proffering an alternative metaphor of play. I think we can talk about this topic alone. I, I want to talk about many topics, but yeah. this topic is actually, again, on my mind very yeah. heavily because the idea of play from one side is very comforting, right? Because in reality, when you really think about it, 
the end, the final destination for all of us is that we're, you're gonna switch off your console, right? Yes, so, yeah. you know, eventually you, are, you or I or whatever game we're playing, we're just gonna switch off this game console yeah, yeah. and we're gonna be fine, right? Yeah, yeah. But the question is on the path there, if you're a true gamer like I am, suddenly you realize that it actually doesn't matter if you build Leon or not. It doesn't matter if you build Appy or, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you work on slow-mo, yeah. uh, you know, in, in a way, why, what, what motivates us to do those things if it's all about play is a very interesting question, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think that most people that write a book, and you've written books, right? And, uh, and I've written a few good books and one winning not fighting book, which I find, I mm -hmm. find I loved writing. For me, it's not the production of the book. For most authors, it's not the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the worst part. That's the worst part. I've got to tell everyone about it. What? Um, um, I, it's, it's literally the play of of, of, discovery. of of discovery. Yeah, yeah. And for me, we you know myself and Julian, who we I wrote my in my Wing Chun teacher, who we wrote the book with. What was lovely is going to a cabin in the woods and coming across an intellectual challenge that we couldn't answer, going into the woods, doing Wing Chun, walking, th throwing. I remember we had, we spent an hour trying to break a giant piece of wood on a, on a, on a block that we couldn't break. Uh, that was playing. And it was only through playing that we had the intellectual breakthrough. Mm. Uh, and that happened to be around the similarities and the differences of, of our thinking versus Sun Tzu, the art of war. And there are big differences between us and Sun Tzu. But, um, uh, I think playing gives you uh, insight. It gives you, uh, it, it brings you back to the present moment because mm. what we are fundamentally about is rerouting ourselves back in the present. And I think play, play absolutely does that. And so I think if I think about the idea of the, the product, the product is not why we do things. We, in fact, if I look at the Bhagavad Gita or if I look at an, an anglicized book about that, the great work of your life, the principle is m play in a masterful way in the present moment and give up all fruits. Do not in any way be uh, governed or owned by the fruits that may or may not come from that mastery and that playful mastery. So I think that that's why we do I mean, of course, it's wonderful to have done Leon and it's wonderful for you to have done all the things that you've done, but it certainly is, doesn't define the present moment, doesn't, mm. doesn't define us as we are sitting here right now. That's such a beautiful way of looking at it. I mean, honestly, of course, as a gamer, so I am a very serious yeah. gamer, huh? Yeah. Um, I've been stuck. So Bungie uh, made Halo uh, Infinite much more complex, much more difficult than all other Halos. Right. And like I used to be legendary in all other <laughs> Halos and I'm actually struggling to finish oh, legendary right. on, on uh, in, in the last Halo. And, and it's interesting because I've been stuck with one of those bosses now, believe it or not, for the last 38 days. Wow. I, I, I practice four times a week, 45 minutes a day, uh, because I'm, you know, I'm sort of playing at an Olympic champion level, wow, if you want. Wow, it's just yeah. really, really yeah, yeah. Uh, flow, really. Yeah. And I literally play a, around a, a minute and a half every single time I encounter that boss and he kills me. And then I play another minute and a half and another minute and a half and another minute and a half for 45 minutes. And, you know, when people ask me like, well, how do you do that? Are you not frustrated? And I'm like, no, I'm going to play for 45 minutes. It doesn't matter yeah. if I kill him or not, yeah, really, yeah, right? Yeah. And every time you do this, you're enjoying it more. You're discovering little things, you're yeah. gaining skills. And eventually, sooner or later, he's going to die. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so You never know when, in, in mastery, we'd say, we ne you never know when the breakthrough will come. Absolutely. You cannot control the breakthrough. Yeah. Just just do the practice. And, 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 and yeah. the funny thing is, if I killed him in 45 seconds, I wouldn't have 38 days of play. Yeah, exactly, you know, it's, it's exactly, really quite yeah, interesting. Yeah. But then you apply those things to other parts of life and you start to question the idea. I mean, again, I, I, I tend to share very openly. I, I, I struggled for a while uh, after my wonderful um, uh, wife uh, and I separated to find a steady relationship. And, you know, at a point in time, I almost gave up. And, you know, I was like, this is not working. And then one of my friends, uh, like a year ago, sat with me and said, is dating really so horrible? I mean, I see the women that you're with, <laughs> you shouldn't really be complaining. Why would you give up? Like, what, why are you so focused on, and I need come. to love the second life yeah, of my yeah, life yeah, yeah. when what you're actually 
having in your life is yeah. amazing, yeah. amazing, yeah. amazing beings that come into my life, enrich it in so many ways. Yeah, not maybe the perfect match and eventually we we're, it doesn't last, but isn't that yeah. the nature yeah. of life yeah. itself, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I think you've reached an insight there. Yeah. So, t- so tell me about the difference between building a business for good to do good and building a business uh, for profit. And then, you know, if it does good, that's fine. I mean, what one of them says, I'll build a business for good and I hope that good will make me profits. The other will say, I, I'll build a business for profits and hope that profits will also leave a bit of impact in life. What, what, what was the difference in your process? What was the difference in your experience? Henry, who was uh, my partner uh, for a while, for, for the first part of, of Leon, up until about 2014. Um, he, he and I um, were at Bain and & Company. And our job fundamentally was to make businesses more valuable. That was literally that, full stop. You make businesses more valuable, end of story. Um, and anything about altruism was, was described as um, enlightened self-interest rather than yeah. actually achieving wholeness. Mm. Um, and that's not a criticism. They did really well at that. And actually, they continue to do well at that. And they're an amazing company, Bain & Company. So I'm not certainly not having a uh, saying anything negative about them. But I... Um, I think I always grew up um, with a, uh, I went to a primary school, which was not a classic. It was, it, it, I think it was in 70s education in the UK. I think that primary schools were doing a good job of teaching love, not just Latin. Or mm. I didn't even do Latin in primary school. Um, and I, um, having uh been at Cambridge and had a dance event with Richard who started Innocent, which is and and Adam who started Innocent, which is this lovely juice. Juice, yeah. yeah. Good um, job, guys. Our, our, <laughs> um, we had we did dance events uh, and I had an entertainment company. And my the reason I had the entertainment company was that I wanted to have fun. I wanted to and that's where I met my wife actually one of the uh, one of these events. So I wanted to do dance events, uh, have bands, have fun. And for me fun and joy and play were the objective of that entertainment business that I had. And I knew that I had to, if I wanted to carry on having the fun, uh, that we needed to, we needed to make money. So I, when I was at Procter & Gamble, which again is um, very commercial yeah, entity. very strict. Very strict. Everything is the PG way. Um, I remember a um, wonderful woman who subsequently become a shaman, actually, but certainly wasn't a shaman at the time. Uh, she said, what, what we're doing, John, is we're going to, when I was f- first there, we're going to take all of the branding that's different all over the world and we're going to standardise. So Ule, Oil of Ole, Ule, Olaz, we're going to call it all Ole. And I, jokingly, I said, oh, that's good. So what you're looking to do is to stamp out any last vestige of local identity around the world. <laughs> and she went, you've got it. <laughs> and yes, I was like, exactly, ah, exactly. Yeah, mm, No flavors, no, oh, no taste. Yeah, 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 so right, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You can't even get the irony. Okay. No, she's a wonderful woman. She's become a shaman. Um, but um, I, I, I remember thinking there has to be a different way. I'm not, this isn't, I'm looking around the office. I'm thinking, the only reason that people are doing this is so they can get a slight... The, the, the arguments with the reps about who had a better car, it was like, yeah. literally, I remember my friend Dave McClemens had metallic paint on his car, and one of the other reps was angry. He said, how did you... How were you allowed to get metallic paint on your car? <laughs> uh, and so, so I'm like, wow, is this the level of, like... Is this the level of intellectual conversations we're having? Um, and, and, so, and so for me, I, I realised quite early on that if every business is pursuing money as an outcome and none are considering the whole, then nobody is considering the whole, especially Correct. if big businesses like P&G are, are not considering the whole. Um, and, you know, I, I had a, um, I started to work with an acupuncturist called Wendy Mandy who'd started, helped start Virgin. Um, and uh, she did student magazine at Virgin. She did the first ever record shop. She did tubular bells and all the mail order stuff. And I think, probably for a few years Virgin was before it too became more empty, I think. Um, Virgin for a few years was run by a bunch of people that wanted to do things because of the positive outcome. 
Uh, I think for a while, Body Shop, um, even though now it's owned by L'Oreal, and I think it's lost fundamentally its its revolutionary zeal, uh, was a company again that tried to do good. And and so for me, I was inspired by people like Anita Roddick, um, who were genuinely trying to build a community. Now, when you have entrepreneurs like Anita Roddick, eventually the thing gets out of hand and the professionals do take over and their span of control, they don't have the span of control that can retain the values as things scale. And that's a pretty common sort of uh, story, isn't it? Um, but I, I thought to myself, I want to prove that you can have a business at scales. I'm not sure we ever, ever did it. We, we're, we're only ever 100 million pounds compared to Amazon. That's not a lot. Mm. Um, but um, I wanted to prove that good could scale uh, and that um, we could sincerely put doing good at the heart of the company. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, when um, the pandemic hit and um, lockdown happened in the UK, every single chain closed. Uh, Starbucks closed, McDonald's closed, Pret closed, everybody closed. We were the only food outlet that stayed open in the, in the, first, in the first lockdown. And the reason that we did that was that making money wasn't the objective. Making it easy for everybody to eat and live well was the objective. So whilst we lost money, we provided with our partners, who uh, a wonderful individual actually, who doesn't want to be named, but provided a lot of money to support us as well. Uh, us and he provided a million meals to frontline uh, hospital workers who otherwise uh. would not have been fed. Uh, they would not have been fed. There was nowhere for them to eat. There were no canteens in the hospitals. They were covered in PPE. So we had to get the food right to the wards. And um, the amount of you know, letters that we've had thanking us for that um, is fantastic from CEOs and from the nurses and doctors themselves. So that explains uh, hopefully just one example of why a business that pretends or greenwashes or ESGs its, its purpose, I mean, uh, is different from one who's, actually fundamental purpose is to make it easier for everyone to eat and live well. So a lot of these businesses, they say profit is, I mean, JP Morgan said everyone has a good reason for doing something. Oh, and then there's the real reason. So the, the good reason for doing something is the greenwashed purpose that, that wraps around a profit motive, if that makes sense. But if your actual purpose is to make it easy for everyone to eat and live well, you don't close in the pandemic. You carry on and make it easier for everybody to eat and live well. And I have to say that in indirect ways, that actually comes and ultimately makes it easier to make profit in the long run because the reputational impact that that has or the landlords start to support you because they recognize what you're doing. Yeah. The suppliers support you because you rec they recognize what you're doing. In the long run, customers repay you for that. So although you don't do it for that reason, all I'm saying is that it's not a bad thing to focus on a real purpose as opposed to a, a pretend purpose. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Yeah, yeah, I, have, yeah. I have to admit to you that when in the early years of my stay at Google, where we discussed don't be evil almost every single day, like every other meeting, the question don't be, you know, is this evil? Would that be evil? Would come up, right? It was easier to do business, right? It really, yeah. oh, it really was because because you had this touchstone, or because 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 the you, conversation you, was allowed because you believed, yeah, in what you were doing. Yes. I think we humans, somewhere innately inside us, realize that a fancier car is not the purpose of life. It's it, this is this life is not about making more money. Did you ever read, read Drive by Daniel Pink? Is a book called uh, Drive, no, and, no, he, I and, should, yeah. and and uh, it's, it's a good book. But it well, it made me laugh because it was like leading social scientists have discovered that it's some it's other things other than money drive us. I'm like, <laughs> wow, these clever leading social scientists, how clever are they? Tell me what they are. Like, are you know, wow. I was like, <laughs> things other than other than money drive yeah. people. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, we, and we know it's about problem solving. It's about contribution. It's about camaraderie. It's about all the things that pack. I mean, my dog, my dog is not driven by making money. Money is, what, what is money? I mean, yeah. I, uh, you know, every time I host an expert on the topic of money, the number one, you know, part of the conversation that comes up is money doesn't actually exist. 
Money is an artificial construct that we've made and now suddenly we're all chasing it. I mean, on the opposite side of what you did, I remember vivid, I'm not, I'm not gonna name a name, but I have, I had a friend of mine who was an, like a, a world leading, world renowned um, sushi chef who had restaurants in uh, New York and California. And, you know, and when, when the first pandemic hit, uh, she shut down literally within days, if not a couple of weeks. And I say that with love, I mean, mm-hmm. still a friend, but it, it puzzled me because not just for the people, I mean, if you're a world leading sushi chef, you were, she was getting billionaires in there, right? Shows, right? Yeah. But she had a team that worked for years mm-hmm. with her. And then suddenly they were out of a job. Like, do we not have a responsibility for that team that yeah. gave us the yacht and gave yeah, us yeah, the, yeah. you know, the big apartment uh, in, in yeah, New York, yeah. uh, Manhattan, or, you know, do we not have those responsibilities? Capitalism seems to be so devout of values. If it's legal, then it's yeah, ethical. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. yep, let's do it. Well, Doesn't matter. You make a good point, which is the, the concept of the unseen hand as this thing, which is the system can operate without human agency or without values. That can't possibly be true. There's the, I mean, like a knife, you can't leave a knife. Knife is a, is a tool like capitalism tool. It's what humans do with the knife that's important. You can stab someone or you can cut some bread. And I think that the idea that you shouldn't apply any moral agent, moral values or human agency to a system and has somehow allow the system to run itself with this single money output, it can't be true. There is no system that humans have created that can operate devoid of human agency or value or, or, mm, more, or moral mm, code. Mm. So for me, I mean, there, there's an issue with A, what, how we measure, measure capitalism, how we measure share price and the externalities that are not taken into account with that. But there's also the issue that the leaders and everybody in that company must have a voice uh, that leads to some kind of um, compass of truth. I, I almost said morality because, and I stopped for on morality because I, as a practitioner, or hopefully a practitioner, but as a student, a student of the Tao Te Ching, there's a verse in there that says, when the Tao is lost, there is goodness. When, the good, when goodness is lost, there's morality. And when morality is lost, there's ritual. Say, say this again. So the in in Taoism, the idea is that um, the Tao is uh, a word that's meant to describe the ultimate truth and where everything coincides. As soon as you start to, it's a little bit like when Buddha was asked after his contemplation what is the answer, he pointed to an apple. And the reason he pointed to an apple was that, this is an advert for a computer, but the reason (laughs) that he he didn't put, he could could have been a Dell. No, no, no. (laughs) Actually, he actually pointed to an actual apple. I mean, when you say Dell, that that talks about your age. I know, I know. Well, I think they're all the rage, aren't they still Dell? I've still still, still got business studies about Dell. I have Michael Dell. Do do people still have Dells? I don't know. That was my consulting computer, laptop at the the time, absolutely. Um, um, It was an IBM. No, no, but the IBMs are still around, aren't they? Anyway, they are. uh, By the way, my dad worked for NCR, which was a competitor. So I've been I worked for that. NCR for a short You're while. You're kidding actually. me. Oh, yeah, cool. yeah. I'd like to talk about NCR. Yeah. Oh, my dad worked. Yeah. Leon. Yeah. My dad, Leon, worked ah, for NCR. Okay. Right. Leon worked for right. NCR, right. yeah. Right. Oh, sorry, yeah, not the company, my dad. Anyway, anyway, back to my point. The reason that the reason that Buddha pointed at something was he recognized as soon as he used his words to describe truth, the truth would be lost. Because our ability to communicate the truth and the constructs that we've developed through language are fantastic, but totally inadequate Correct. to describe a truth, if yeah. that makes sense. So, Absolutely. And as soon as we are describing, and as soon as one agent describes to another agent, they're bringing their own insecurities to that conversation as well. So the reason that Buddha pointed at an apple was the truth is there, and as soon as I name it, and the first verse of the Tao Te Ching, there are 82 verse verses to the Tao Te Ching says, basically says, in a nutshell, un, the Tao must be unnamed. 
So the Tao is almost, it's like, it could be like the way or flow or, or, or the universe. So the reason that the word Tao is used is it's the word that's least, that means as little as it can to describe the thing that cannot be described. Does that make sense? And so in Taoism, it says, as soon as you name something, and as soon as you, you start consciously thinking about, good, about this thing called the Tao, you lose the Tao, and you have something called goodness. As soon as you lose goodness... What is goodness? Goodness is, as, is the, the truth that's as close to the Tao as possible uh, but is not the Tao because you've named it. So, but the very fact that you've it's, had to it's ask like the me. Highly, the highly refined version of the yes, truth yes. that can be contained in human communication. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Mm. So now you and I have a conversation about goodness, exactly as you have done, yeah. right? Yeah. So we, but the problem is, as soon as we have a conversation about goodness, it applies, starts to apply judgment to it, mm. right? Mm. Is it good or bad to send a kid to school in Africa? Someone might say, wow, that's brilliant. They're being like us and they're going to sit in rows and they're going to learn algebra just like us. Whereas in, in LA, all the, all the Silicon Valley people are sending their kids to forest schools mm. to not sit in rows of classrooms. So <laughs> what is good to somebody, it now suddenly becomes objective. It's just mm. subjective. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the next argument then is when goodness is lost, you have morality. What's morality? It's rules. It's you must do this. That's moral. It's the church telling you what is moral or what's moral. It's your parents telling you what is morally right and what is moral. So morality is a less pure form of goodness, and goodness is a less pure form of the Tao. Does that make mm, sense? Mm, mm. Then finally what you have is ritual, which is I do the Lord's Prayer. I sit there and I'm going to, yeah, who's our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And, and basically all I'm thinking about is how I'm going to make more money the next week. And oh, look, there's a guy. Yeah, but I, but I stick to the ritual. Yeah, I stick to the ritual. Which is not a bad thing. It's, it's, right? not, it's yeah. better than nothing. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. yeah. It's better than nothing. Or, yeah. or, or incense or going down the church and, or, or, the, or, a, rose, or a, ro you know, a, a rosary bead. Well, there are rituals, right, that we adopt. Christmas, it's lovely, it's fine. And it gives us comfort. Rituals give us comfort. But it is not as powerful as morality, it's not as powerful as goodness, and it's not as powerful as the Tao, if that makes sense. You, you know what I love most about Eastern religions? So I, I studied yeah. all religions, yeah. like not all, if nobody has, but yeah. I studied Taoism, I studied yeah. Hinduism, um, Buddhism, yeah. Islam, Sufism, yeah. um, right. you know, Christianity, Judaism, and so on. So, so, so the, the, um, the, the, the interesting side of Eastern religions is they take it from the right side down, you know, uh, Abrahamic religions, if you want, mostly focus, at least the practice of it now, mostly focuses on from the bottom side up. So they focus so much more on the ritual yes. in a correct belief that if you stick to the ritual, you will sort of conclude what the moralities are. If you, if you, you know, uh, um, really start to ponder what the moralities are, you're going to get to the goodness. And then if you stick with the goodness long enough, by the end of your life, you're going to get to the truth, right? That's really interesting because the progression of Wing Chun, which is the martial art I talk about in the book, it starts out quite directive around yeah. the actions. Yeah. And it's only as you go through the four doors yeah. that you realize the truth behind some of the form and actions that you have in the first instance. Yeah. Yeah. So you become increasingly conscious and then you go back to being unconscious again. And it's that cycle yeah. which, we, and you have to start with the rituals. You have to start with the... But, but everyone does. Everyone does. I mean, even, even Buddhism, yeah. you know, will tell you, okay, go be, be a monk, yeah. which is a yeah. very, very yeah. strict regime, if you want. Uh, and you do that for 17 years and then you advance. But but when the conversation is happening, it's not about the rituals. Yeah, the, when the when yeah. the when the pondering, when the reflection is happening, it's about what's the heart of compassion, or what is this, or what is that. It's it's about the, that top line of it. Do you think that we've lost a lot uh, as humanity, as business leaders, by giving up on spirituality in a way? Yes, yeah, so I think I think where spirituality can be, uh, people take the piss out or mickey yeah is that the word isn't it yeah yeah it was a piss out of the idea of spirituality and it is difficult to it is difficult to describe um but i think that um we do need to see and it's it's difficult because suddenly 
two years ago, no one was talking about mental health in business. And now you can't open a newspaper or magazine or a podcast or whatever without someone talking about mental health at work. So we need to be careful because suddenly people will suddenly adopt spirituality in quite empty ways. Uh, you know, if it's not if it's not done in a in a considered way, but I do think that absolutely the world has lost a lot, um, and the world has uh, believes that has put all the emphasis on rational thinking, has put uh, doesn't understand Jungian archetypes, doesn't understand the power of magic and storytelling, and doesn't understand the power of of spirit and attention to wholeness yes, and yes. ritual practice. Yeah. And I'll just give you just one example of, of, of civilian life, as in non-commercial, non-military life, where I remember where... Um, <laughs> non-commercial, non-military. Actually, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a new one. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. it's, yeah. it's like when you're in business, you're not a civilian. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, what I mean, yes, exactly. What I mean is it's like, it's like true life. Uh, <laughs> is, 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 I remember when I grew up, the idea of Easter was you had Easter eggs on it at Easter. Mm. And you had Lent was the period in which you didn't eat chocolate. Mm. Now, supermarkets sell Easter eggs and Cadbury's cream eggs for the whole of Lent, mm. and you see kids eating chocolates. Mm. People now eat more chocolate in Lent <laughs> Interesting. because it's Easter time <laughs> yeah. than they did before. Mm. And those sorts of disciplines that in Wing Chun were provided by Confucianism, those kinds of um, knowing when to fast, which you have in uh, Ramadan. In, in, in Ramadan, yeah. uh, in, in Islam, and other religions have as well. Those are really important disciplines. And in Wing Chun, those were given to us by, Confucian, by Confucius, whereas the Tao gave us the ability to flow within those rituals and within those structures. So, so Confucianism provided the riverbank and Taoism provided the flow. And I think that we, we absolutely need to, to, to remember those as society and business is no different. So yes, we need to remember them in business because we need to remember them for our lives more broadly. So, so I mean, this is really an interesting uh, point to reflect on. I mean, when you talk about Ramadan and fasting or Lent or, 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 or whichever, every, every, every spiritual faith has some kind of fasting. Uh, you know, it, it just reminds me of the of the power of intention, really, because it, it is not a lie that fasting is quite fashionable nowadays, mm. right? So, you know, if you talk to anyone about intermittent fasting, yes. they'll say, "Yep, well, it's I'm, become an I'm, app." I'm, exactly, it's like a it's like one of those adverts. You're like, skip ad, yes, yeah, skip the bloody ad. <laughs> <laughs> right? We 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 definitely definitely believe in fasting yes, now, it's a but when it when, when it's given to someone through spirituality, the intention is, "No, I'm not going to do that." Well, it's like right? the difference between Eastern yoga and California yoga. Right? Eastern yoga <laughs> is about the practice, mm -hmm. and it's actually about the immediacy and doing yoga in the present moment. In California, yoga has been turned into a yoga for better abs. Oh, yes. And people absolutely. do yoga for better abs, and then they fight each other to get to the juice bar. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They get, <laughs> they get annoyed if someone's in the line ahead of them. Do you know what I mean? And so you, intermittent fasting could actually be, you could abstract an element, a health element, but if you haven't got the spiritual element attached to it, then you're missing something. And I think a lot of our Western fasting, intermittent fasting, 5-2, all that sort of stuff, it, it, it takes away the the spiritual reflection of fasting, as you say. Absolutely, and, and, which uh, is the thing, yes. really. And, yeah. and also the gratitude yeah. that comes from when you can start to eat again. Uh, no, I mean, you're suddenly grateful for everything. I'll, I'll tell you yeah. openly. I mean, I, so I've, I, I practice lots of religions, one yeah. of which, of yeah. course, is Islam, which practiced for much of my life. And I've rarely, I've rarely ever missed a day in Ramadan my entire life. That's a very long uh you know, yeah. uh, passage, if you want, or pathway. And I, and I will tell you openly by, it's not the first few days where you learn to reflect. It's day 22, 23, yeah. when your body starts to really go like, how do people live like this? Because the idea is to actually connect to those who don't have. It's to, it's to basically get yourself to the point where you go like, I actually feel how the poor yes, feel. Yeah. I feel how a drought feels. Yes. I feel how, you know, people suffer yeah. around the yeah. world while we're rushing around yes, our yes, cities yes, and not yes. feeling anything about it. Yes. And, you know, it, it's really quite interesting. And, and I will tell you the first time you get this, the first time, I mean, I started of course to be more and more spiritual through my life. The first time you get that moment of reflection to go like, I am so blessed 
to choose to do this, not to have this forced on me, is an, a moment of compassion that really never return, you know, never reverses. Like for the rest of your life, you will feel yeah. what what the poor feel, what the hungry Empathy feel. Empathy and gratitude. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I wonder, you know, if that power of empathy, power of gratitude, power of compassion, power of intention can be brought to business at all. I mean, is there a way what we, we can tell people today, look, you know, there's nothing wrong with business. Go to work every day, just have a different intention behind it that would change the way you do it? What do you think? I, I I find that it's hard to be honest. You know, business sucks you in, and especially if you're not um, if you're not at the top. And you and I both know you're never really at the top, even as CEOs. Yeah. The right? CEO is number one slave. Absolutely, <laughs> definitely. I mean, I'm, 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 my 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 work as CEO has has always been a lot more difficult because I had many more bosses. Yeah, you know, I had. Yeah. I had the shareholders, yes, I had the course, board, I had the chairman, I had, of you know, course. investors, I had everyone. And employees sit in the building thinking, oh, the CEO's the boss. Yes. And no, Rude. no, 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 yeah. the CEO's yeah. not the boss. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I, and, and I, and I, you know, I think the, the, uh, the intention, however, I think is a privilege that the CEO yes, has. Yes, yes, absolutely. Be, because like you rightly said, you know, there is a, a, a public uh, mission and a true motive or true, uh, you know, uh, a target, okay, you could do it the other way around. I mean, my, my last startup, which sadly didn't uh, work really well because of um, unexpected bumps on the road, let's say. Uh, yeah, it was, of course, seen by, my, by our investors as an opportunity to be a multi-billion dollar business. But in reality, in my heart, I believed that I could use the reinvention of consumerism was the statement yes. that to yes. reinvent consumerism in a way that was good for the planet. I believed that there, were, there was a lot of money in that. And and had it succeeded, I believe we would have made a big well, difference. I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sadly, we, we had to sell our IP eventually, so others own it now. But, but, but the truth is, if you really think at the top level, uh, you know, you can you can say Coca Cola pollutes more than Pepsi or whatever, you know, or has more plastic, single use plastic, or you can say aeroplanes pollute more uh, than than uh, cars or whatever. But at the core of why our planet is deteriorating, at the core of why our value system is deteriorating, is uh, that ancient realization that the uh, you know that the Stoics have realized, which is humanity is all about consuming, right? And that we will always want to consume more. And perhaps my attempt was not to, was not to say consume less. I was, I, I wanted people to consume differently, but to enable them to make the right decisions while consuming through information. And at the same time, to deliver things to them in a way that doesn't harm the planet. The, the, the yeah. delivery network is the issue, right? Yeah. The yeah. fact that we allow ourselves to eat an apple from New Zealand that's an issue because an apple from New Zealand versus an apple from, you know, uh, Manchester, okay? Uh, the only difference the consumer sees is the price tag, right? While if I, add, if I added also a CO2 cost yeah. tag to it, some people, at least the ones that want to make a difference will look at it and say, yeah, it is a pound cheaper. Yeah, it smells a little nicer, but it's killing the planet. Mm. I think that brings, us on, doesn't it, to the whole question of externalities and the whole question of, you know, how we account for things. And, you know, when we were doing, uh, you know, I've done a reasonable amount of work, probably not enough, but a reasonable amount of work on the principle of natural capital accounting and how, um, you know, externalities are considered. I remember at, at Bain studying the Harvard Business School uh, model that basically says, don't worry, kids. The the share price of a company takes into account <laughs> the yeah, impact of communities and the press and the world. And so as long as you focus on the share price, you will, don't worry, be absolutely looking at total systemic value, which is bullshit, right? Um, and so we know that businesses have a free ride on the communities that they can harm. Businesses have a free ride on 
the pollution or the destruction of rainforests or the destruction of sea habitats uh, that isn't accounted for on their balance sheet. So it means we've got all the measurements wrong. So no wonder that you know we're measuring. You know, the wonder that the the people are suffering and the wonder that the planet is suffering because the the way that we're measuring everything does not take those into account. So yeah. you then end up thinking, you know, uh, and a friend of mine started a company called True Cost, uh, which I think was bought by Standard and Poor, uh, which Puma use to do natural capital accounting to put. And this is controversial because people say you can't value nature, uh, but the thing is, you can't. Also, you can't not not value nature. So ignore value nature exactly. So so you know you can't say that you know a fly, one fly, although it might be a brilliant fly, is the same as all the you know all the elephants in the world. You, there must be some kind of way of some way of of measuring the comparative impact of a project, um, but we have to start measuring those. And Puma, for example, has adopted true cost um, and natural capital accounting. And I like to see all businesses saying this is our profits. All oh, but by the way, um, in P and L terms, the destruction of wildlife, the poisoning of the river. And the production of X amount of CO2 or methane in our business means that we're actually loss making because actually net net for society, we've actually destroyed value. And that should be absolutely adopted. Uh, now, whether that should be legislation or whether um, you know that should be enhanced by science-based targets as well, because you I don't think you can put you can just rely on a monetized value of nature. You have to say, okay, we're also going to measure. Uh, our water consumption, our energy consumption, our pollution, uh, and the destruction of earth and soil and natural habitats. But I think natural capital accounting has to be adopted because, it, for a start, employees will, will should demand it from their companies. Employees should actually, when they're looking at a job ad, they'd say, I'd like to work at a company that does actually look at its real, true impact on value for society. And so that's the sort of, but that has to come with some spiritual spiritual that comes with some spiritual reawakening as well as well as the pure financial measurements i mean it's it's, it's such a, an, an intriguing thought to think that we can if not everyone wants to start a leon if not everyone wants to start a google that organizes the world information early years of google then we should we should demand it by regulation that yeah. You know, when you start something, at least you need to be good for society. I, 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 I will openly tell you. Of course, the challenge with that is com is global competitiveness, right? If if this is applied in China but not applied in America, then the Chinese companies are at a at a disadvantage, basically. Or if it's applied in Germany but not in France, then the companies in Germany are not able to export properly because they have to put in more costs in making those things a reality, right? And, you know, this, uh, believe it or not, I was shocked when I knew that. I don't know if that changed, but there was an actual uh, regulation in Germany at a point in time where briberies were tax deductible. Right? Well, and, yeah. and, 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 and it was simple because, you know, the German companies would appeal to the German tax authorities and basically say, look, you know, we've if I, if I, am, we've had if I, yeah, if yeah. I am, if I'm to Operating do business in this country, yeah, yeah. In, in, in this country or that country, the only way to do the, to do business is to actually bribe someone. It's not, this is not Germany. Yeah. This is the way yeah. business yeah. is done yeah. in yeah. those yeah. places. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it shocks me, you know, the heard, the first time I heard this, I asked why. And I, and they said, because it's, Otherwise, the German GDP yeah. would suffer, mm. right? Mm. And and I think those I, well, insanities. I, I, I think we have to understand in the system who has the power, um, and of course, a lot of the sh probably shareholding of the big businesses do come back to a small number of an unfortunately small number of individuals that probably control the uh, the investment in a lot of these businesses. But we must remember, I think, our power as employees, and we must remember our power as people that own pensions, to make sure that the um, to, to to start deal with this global competitiveness point is we need to be able to say, you know what, um, as pensioners, we don't want our pensions invested in certain sectors. Yeah, 
and a company that's actually doing a good job to start to lead the way in this is 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 Aviva, um, where um, there's a, a woman called Eugenie Mathieu who's helping Aviva uh, to reallocate its resources to businesses that those pensioners would probably want to uh, be part of. There was a um, there was a, a BBC, the BBC was you know that had this thing called Children in Need and uh, Comic Relief and. They were putting. It turns out they were putting the money uh, once they'd made it, and before they'd spent it, they were putting it and investing it in companies like arms companies. So people <laughs> were like, "Hold it, we've we've raised money for we've raised money for this project, and now it's going to to here." So I think we've got more sensible ways that we can allocate our pension money, uh, and, and 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 pensioners should seek pensions that you know potentially. Invest in companies that do at least report natural capital accounting, in the, or in natural capital accounting terms. And then, as employees, I mean, I don't know whether you feel it now, but the the it shouldn't be called a war for talent. We'll come back to that. But the competitiveness for talent. If I can't hire someone because I'm not um, doing good for society, then people should not work for those companies if they can avoid it. And the good news is that more and more in certain sectors, employees hold the pen. Uh, and they can they could actually decide which companies they work for. Certainly, the, the top talent can decide that. Definitely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. I mean, when at the times I spent at Google, that was exactly the idea that if you wanted the top talent, you had to appeal to them, yeah. and the top talent were definitely motivated by more than just making a salary at the end of the month. Okay, I I, I want to talk about sure, dance sure. because oh, beca because you you said you want to talk about dance, but before like before be, be, <laughs> before I before I go there, I mean. You and I are maybe in a slightly more privileged yes. place, right? You know, we've been CEOs, we had some career, you know, yeah. career success and so on and so forth. Uh, but I am a huge believer in the idea of using business for good. I mean, one yeah. one of the things that's making one billion happy my mission successful yeah. is I treat it as a business. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, a sl yeah, slow yeah. slow mo. Yes. You know, one of the reasons why slow mo is reaching so many people delivering a positive message and idea for people to reflect on the things that matter is because it's in a bit using the principles of business mm -hmm. uh, to try and find, you know, what people are interested yeah. in and so on. Yeah. Now, for our listeners who may not be in your position, what, what do you think one should do if they want, if they want it to be a little more purpose driven, a little more goodness driven, if you want, uh, as they go to work? Um, well, I think that um, Henry, my business partner, was with MNC Saatchi the other day, and they um, have been doing work on understanding people. I almost said consumers. Uh, <laughs> uh, people, humans. Humans. Humans, <laughs> and humans. And I think let's take the climate crisis as an example, and that's not the only crisis that we have. Um, but the climate crisis, the insight was, number one, people are worried. Number two, people want to do something. Number three, they don't know what they should do. Um, and four, the big insight was the single biggest change uh, that we can make is by um, switching our diets to uh, more of a plant-based diet. That's Correct. the single biggest thing that we can do right now, which is eat less red meat, not cut it out completely, but recognize the fact that from a, a health as well perspective, that potentially having... Uh, reducing significantly the amount of red meat that we have, but making sure that the red meat that we do eat is from grass-fed or uh, good pastures or cows from good pastures, because the the impact on our environment from bad farming, bad meat farming, is is horrendous. Um, uh, that's the single biggest thing that we can do, mm -hmm. um, and uh, 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 encouraging the uh, the supply chain and the farmers to farm vegetables and fruit uh in a way which um doesn't use as much pesticides that starts to to take ourselves off the addiction of of, of, of fertilizers um that that's the single biggest thing that we can do uh, we can adopt a more of a plant-based diet and lo and behold um it does have an impact on our health as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. um but because of the fiber because of the nutrients mm -hmm. because of everything mm -hmm. um and so I think that in terms of living, 
the first thing that, that one can do is to is to make that shift and secondly is to continue as consumers to try and uh, buy from those companies that are genuinely doing good and the trouble is it's becoming more difficult because the ability of marketeers to greenwash and to value signal unfortunately has becoming quite a skill uh, they have become quite adept at making it look like they're doing something um so i think that what i'd like to see is um some uh, an entrepreneur a young entrepreneur providing the information app based to consumers for them to truly find out the truth of a company mm -hmm. what i'd love someone to be able to, to provide is you literally hold not even the barcode you hold a picture like you do with those wine apps mm. hold something over a product and i know that they are appearing now but something that gives you how they buy from their customers the net impact on soil degradation or deforestation or plastic consumption or their recycle rates or whatever i think that that kind of transparency of information um should be something that hopefully a few entrepreneurs can can try and make more more accessible absolutely yeah, yeah I, f I i find it shocking really that we have uh nutrition facts on the pack but we don't have the amount of carbon that yes. it was it used or yeah. the you know the plastic that will yes, end exactly, up coming yeah. out of it you know in, a, in an interesting way if businesses have to pay for the negative impact uh, either by you know swaying consumer opinion or even by regulation I, I i thought at a point in time that businesses should literally pay a packaging tax you know yeah. if you use a package yeah. when you're printing that package or producing it yeah. uh, whether it's plastic or cardboard or whatever yeah. There are different tariffs for it because and, there's a know. cost there's a cost of society of that and yeah and if you clear it up if, and yeah. why, why should why exactly should, why should everyone pay it for their taxes exactly yeah, yeah. I, you know i i think the idea of having more transparency is important but but i think you know my question and you answered that really uh, you know kindly and and precisely is that every one of us needs to engage mm -hmm. it's that it's the choices that we make that drive businesses mm -hmm. to either be ethical and positive for our planet or just get away yeah. with, with the murder, really. Yeah. And the, and the cost to our health of just eating junk food, I mean, there is a great cost to it. In the, I mean, the lack of energy that we have, our inability to work and therefore get a good job mm -hmm. is impacted. Yeah. So I think that um, there's a major cost to our health and our energy levels and our... Yeah our ability to to feel positive and happy yeah okay so uh, yeah, let's dance. talk about dance yeah, yeah. Uh, dance as dance. The, uh, and as we would say oh, it in the da uk dance. <laughs> dance yeah dance. as we would say it in the about dance I, the yeah. trouble is about rhyming a song you yeah. need to describe am i is it dance or dance because the rhyme in a song we, is completely yeah, different yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. is it france uh, is it France? Or, or, Does it yeah. die with France? Yeah, so you can't, absolutely. You can't, yeah. I, there was a song yeah. by the Spice Girls yeah. that I remembered recently that actually was American accent. It's yeah, like, oh, right. Uh, yeah, they probably packaged it for very exactly. good. Yeah, yeah. I, was like, I was like, what's wrong yeah. with them? Anyway, having said that, um, I, I hosted a couple of weeks ago, Eleanor uh, Salman, who uh, um, basically left her job in the United Nations and uh, and took a year to dance wow. uh, all, all over the world, did, right. did, learned 18 dances. And I was like, damn, that should be my life. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you are totally into dance as well, right? So, so t tell me about what's going well, on. Well, so I, right now I have a, um, this, this isn't shoehorning a, 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 like a, uh, an advert in, this is just true. So, so I'm working on a, a mental health app called Ed Can Help. And it's, uh, it's a sound therapy uh, used by uh, psychiatrists from uh, Harley Street, the Priory, and various different fields, and lots of psychotherapists within the NHS and elsewhere. And it's a rhythm uh, of sound which has dramatic effect on mental health, and it disrupts negative thoughts, and it allows the brain to resettle into a more happy place. And it's... It's interesting to me because it's a it's a sound version of EMDR, which is the eye movement desensitization. And what uh, we're realizing, scientists uh, and the psych <laughs> psychiatrists, other scientists are realizing, is that there is there's something about rhythm in the human body. Oh, absolutely. 
and our heartbeat, mm. our circadian rhythms are all, everything is a constant rhythm, a constant wave, a sign, our chakras, our mm. digestion, everything about us is actually a series of rhythms. And they, they can represent themselves in terms of sound or they can represent themselves through a combination of sound and movement. So there's a great guy called Mark Leponis. He was at a wellness retreat called Canyon Ranch in America. And he and there's another doctor that was there called Mark Hyman. But Mark Leponis still practices very much in his business, Stone Over Health, in Lennox, in the Berkshires. And he's written a book called Ultra Longevity. The first thing he says, you must breathe to live a long life. The second thing is you must dance. Mm -hmm. Now, he doesn't necessarily mean purely ballroom dancing. What he means is tennis is a form of dance. Does that make sense? Or ballet or certain forms of dance. Moving to rhythm. Moving to rhythm. And he says the impact that this has on your immune system, and ultra longevity is fundamentally about how to optimize your immune system, he says is, is incredible. And so the... Um, My wife was, uh, I used to organize dance events at university. And I think that if I look now at EMDR and sound therapy, like are you like help. a serious dancer? Like, you know, I like dancing at dance events. I'm not, you're, not yeah. You're, are you yeah, good at yeah. it? I, I, I would have to ask my daughters. I don't think they'll be good at it. Um, I probably thought I was back in the day. Uh -huh. um, um, and so, you know, when electronic dance music first came about, which was probably, you know, for me, 89, 90, I was at university with, with the guys that started Innocent. We had a dance event uh, called Please. And um, we, uh, anyway, um, and I, anyway, I digress, I digress. Um, but the bottom line was those dance events mirrored what Ed can help and EMDR do today. There were strobes. Uh, so, so, so the light, the the intermittent flashing of lights, the intermittent flashing of uh, you know the, the the technology that was in those dance events, the the nature of electronic dance music, it was fundamentally therapy. If you think about the way that therapy, like Ed can help and other things, are now applied, and 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 and, and ballroom dance, in a similar way, had that rhythm and that movement to it. And in when you're not fighting, I talk about the idea of. What you see is not what you do. Mm. And it, that's from a, a book written about dance that was recommended and, and, and edited by a friend of mine called Jane Melvin. She does a lot of dance in America. Dance is her main amateur pursuit. She goes all over America dancing. Um, and what the book was about was explaining that dance fundamentally comes from within. And when we copy a dance, we copy it outside in. We should be experiencing it inside out. And this is a great metaphor for many things in life. Mm. We, when, when we look at a dancer, we say, oh, that's interesting. They seem to be putting their right foot forward. Then they're putting their left foot back. And so we consciously start to mimic the dancer. When that dancer is dancing, they are feeling the music. They're feeling the flow and they're in the flow. And their brain, their rational brain, isn't saying... I'm now going to put my right foot forward. I'm now going to put my left foot back. They are in flow. When we try and copy someone who's in flow, we are not in flow ourselves. It takes mm. a long while mm. for us to go back to that unconscious state of being in flow, if that makes sense. Mm. So this book, What You See Is Not What You Do, means that fundamentally you've got to embed yourself into the joy and playfulness of the present moment In order to dance, it is not a mechanical copying exercise of movements, if that makes sense. And so for me, there are there's the immune system benefit of dance. And my wife got she she got into the final of Dancing with the Stars, or strictly as it's called here, uh, with a guy called Anton de Beck, who's now a judge. And that was the most one of the most joyous periods of her life because she was dancing every day. Yes, she was getting fitter, but the emotional journey that she went through or the emotional experience of that dance was I can't agree more. yeah i mean my my um, i'm not a dancer i used to be quite a dancer as, as a young man and then uh, i got so engaged in the in the left-brained world right yeah uh, and you know being an executive and a yeah. businessman yeah. and a trader yeah. and so yeah. on and so forth and i actually lost it somehow right. of right. course i i still have yeah. the rhythm but somehow i lost and what sort of dance did you do hmm? did you do ballroom dance or just dancing i, 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 I did a bit of everything yeah. I, mean, i never yeah. really did latin dance which i think is what i'm going to probably go back okay, to one good, day good, good. but the, but the, but the trick is this the trick is there is something in us 
it may be in our perception of time, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I had that interesting shamanic breathing uh, yeah. uh, class once and I dedicated it to understanding time, if you want. Uh, I, yeah. I do the weirdest things. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and, and I actually realized that probably there is a difference between the feminine and the masculine because I'm yes, capable yeah. of recognizing each side of me, yes, my, yes, my masculine yes, side yes, and my yes. feminine side. My masculine side is highly associated with the arrow of time, the passage of time along a linear uh, scale, if you want, while my feminine side, perhaps the reason why I'm legendary in video games, believe it or not, is because of my feminine side, because I, it's rhythmic, it's flowing with life, it's flowing where, where, the, where the game is going and so on and so forth. Well, there was a great, I must find out who it was, but my daughter um, encouraged me to listen with her to a woman from California that lives in a yurt in LA. And she was talking about how a lot of masculine energy is actually in uh, in, in ascendancy, whereas actually we need to start with feminine energy, Absolutely. which is womb, mm. stomach, mm. gut, going inside. Absolutely. And actually it's quite earthy. Yeah. It's actually quite grounded, mm -hmm. that, that energy. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of business energy is the energy of escape and ascendancy. Totally. Rather than Doing. groundingness yeah. and... Yeah. and embedding nature yeah. in what we do. And I think, so I talk about the sacred feminine in the book and Wing Chun, which, which the, was the, is a martial art that underpins winning, not fighting. That was developed by women. It was developed by women from the Shaolin Temple, uh, Ung Moi, and then Wing Chun herself, which means beautiful springtime. Uh, and they understood the power of going inside to that energy in both what you might call defense and attack within the martial art. And I think you're absolutely right. We connect with that. I, I believe that in this hyper-masculine world that we've yeah. lived in, sadly, we've created, because of capitalism, once again, a, a world that's completely centered around doing. Yeah. And as a result, it's hyper-masculine. It's all out there. It's all external. That the the one the most important ingredient is is dance and rhythm, yes, music, yes. dance and rhythm. Uh, again, coming back to Alan Watts, he said that what we are is we're a series of tubes. Um, those tubes move. Uh, we, we have lymphatic system, blood systems, gut, and then we have this ganglion, this brain that fundamentally likes to jiggle around. <laughs> so he said we like to jiggle around by dance. We like to jiggle around by going to the football and chanting. We like to j jiggle around at, at concerts, at dance events, but at our heart, we are beings where a, our brain likes to jiggle around whilst its subconscious makes sure the tubes are working. Now so that's, that's, I'm not saying that there isn't more to life. Yeah. I'm not saying no, there isn't more to life. Works. But, yeah, it yeah, definitely works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely works. It definitely It's just all needed. forms of vibration. Yeah. It's all forms of movement. It's all forms of rhythmic movement. Yeah. That make our brain happy. And yeah. have you ever seen the difference between my, my friend Jimmy Allen taught me this between Chronos and Kairos? In, no, what's that? So, so that so so the different gods of time, to your point in, in Greece. Oh, there are gods, so of, gods time. of time. I need to study that and, element of time. I, didn't. I I'm gonna I won't do him or Greek philosophy justice here, but I do know two things. One is that Kronos is the god of like chronological, is the god of um continued repeatable rhythm. So in let's take a business example. Hello. That is Management meetings on a Monday, HR meetings on a Wednesday, yeah. all meetings once a month, AGMs every quarter, you know, call briefings every quarter, one annual general meeting. Mm. That's Kronos. We then have Kairos, who basically cuts across that, and that is a southern event where the Kronos needs to be interrupted. So it could be a hostile takeover, it could, in a hostile inverted commas. It could be something which happens which is not according COVID. to Kronos. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. COVID, exactly. Yeah. And and those that timing it has a different god, and that that god governs things in a completely different way from the sense of Kronos. And when I go and see my my acupuncturist Wendy, let's say I'm, I'm, you know, I'm late, she goes, "Don't worry, I'll stretch time." Uh, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah I mean, we've all been we've all. I mean, in a sound bowl therapy. Uh -huh. You maybe have done it for 45 minutes. It feels I like agree. five hours. I agree. Do you know absolutely. what I mean? So something has happened to time. I, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I can take all of the time in the world and keep talking to you forever. I, I, I think for our listeners to go back and find some of the gold gems that you, you know, dispensed this time around. Uh, isn't it interesting to talk to a CEO who talks about the Tao and dance mm. and play and all of that? But uh, I, I want to I wanna ask you a couple of questions that I usually try to finish with. Of all the things that you've done in life, 
what would you consider is your biggest achievement? Okay, so I'm going to say something that probably a lot of people say, but it's true, is, 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 is my relationship with my daughters. How old? Uh, 21 and 16. You're Actually, 22 and 16. So, so yeah. I just went and surprised my daughter on her, on her birthday in, in, in New York. So she's in New York and she's studying drama. And uh, Eleanor is, is still in the UK. But I, I am... Uh, yeah, I mean, my my daughter Natasha texted me this morning and said, "Oh, you you are my idol," uh, oh. and I just think to have had that as a twenty two year old, see, I'm probably not, but that's very nice of her to say. Yeah. But uh, I just, yeah, I just think that's yeah. the best. Uh, why? The best why, why I, I, when Aya texts me, my daughter, yeah, she actually my 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 Aya is very funny. So she texts me and says, "Dude." Yeah, it's great. It's really and, good. and just the fact that she yeah. tells me that she calls me yeah, dude, well, you are like, a dude, right? Okay, you're, a yeah. cool dad. you're a cool like, dad. You're a cool dad. Life is good, and and what would be what you know of everything that you've learned in spirituality, in business, in relationships? Uh, all of the books you've clearly are a very serious reader that you wrote or read, uh, read or whatever. Um, what would be your secret to happiness? I would say, as I as we have attempted to describe it in the book, which is to recognize that you have everything, you have all the assets required to be happy already. And that happiness is a rediscovery of self. It's not a, an achievement or accumulation of the fruits that the ego uh, seeks. And it's a quick analogy here, because I was given this, which was this story, which was, about the elephant uh, and someone who had carved a beautiful elephant. And the person said, how did you carve such a beautiful elephant? And they said, oh, it was, it's very easy. I just take the bits of the wood or the ivory or whatever it is, take the, wood, the bits of the wood away that are not elephant. <laughs> I love that. I know and I think that once we realize that actually we need to take the bits of us away that are not that happy. Are get us are not happy, that are getting in the way of our happiness or getting in the way of remembering our true self, then I think that that's a question of of, of that rediscovery. It's a, happiness. I think is a question of remembering, a question of remembering, not not discovering elsewhere. Best answer ever. Uh, I love you dearly. Oh bless you're, you. You're a lovely you're, man you're, too. You're you're an amazing, amazing man. Uh, I hope another friend for life. Oh, that likewise, uh, likewise. I've re I've I, I was really looking forward to today, having read all about you, and I've. Really enjoyed our conversation. It's, such, Thank a, you, it's yeah. such a nice conversation. I'd like to talk more about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, let's, yeah, let, yeah. let's let them leave, and then and then you and I can have another tea and coffee. He drinks tea like the British people. That, <laughs> that, that, that was coffee. Uh, but I I am so 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 grateful for your time, John. This was really wonderful, and I'm so grateful to all of you that have joined us today. It's been. Uh, as I always say, uh, an enormously generous thing of you to do to. Uh, listen to slow mo because it gives me the alibi to meet amazing people. So thank you for that. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's conversation, help me share it with as many people as you can. Uh, you know, I really want to grow this further and further and further and reach uh, to to so many people. Hopefully, if you know an entrepreneur or a business person or someone who wants to make a difference with their life, I think this would be an amazing conversation for them, or just someone who wants to dance. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, we've moved, not moved, but we've added a video component to Slow Mo now. Uh, as I travel the world, I'll hopefully meet with some of the locals everywhere and just bring you video that you can see on YouTube. So search for Slow Mo on YouTube or uh, just go to my official channel, uh, Mo Gaudet Official on YouTube. And um, yeah, do like and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube, because uh, that way you can get more uh, content more quickly, as well as all of my other content that I'm posting there. Uh, find me on social media. Uh, I'm Mo underscore Gaudet on Instagram. If you have questions, guest recommendations, uh, I'd really appreciate to hear from you. And uh, yeah, finally, if you haven't rated this podcast uh, five stars on your uh, podcast player, Go ahead and do it. It's a nice thing of you to do. And um, leave a nice comment as well, if you can. Uh, putting all of this together, I will tell you uh, that of all of the things that I do, which I do quite, uh, you know, a few, I think that hour or two that I take to slow down and sit with amazing people like John is probably one of the high, biggest joys of my life. 
uh, I encourage you to do that a little more because it doesn't matter really how busy you are today. There's always going to be an hour or two where you can slow down. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.